So, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our headliner for the evening, Lisa Bellamy. Lisa teaches New York City Level 1 and the online courses Writing Short and Maintaining Your Creative Spirit. Her full-length poetry collection, The North Way, was published in 2018 by Terrapin Books. She is the author of the chapbook Nectar, which won the Aurorian 2011 chapbook contest. Her poems and prose have appeared in Triquarterly, The Sun, Massachusetts Review, The Southern Review, New Ohio Review, Hotel America, Asimov Science Fiction, The Southampton Review, Calix, Simran Review, Fugue, Tiferet, and Pank, among other publications. She has received a Pushcart Prize special mention, the Fugue Poetry Prize, an honorable mention in the year's best fantasy and horror. Lisa is currently working on a new collection and a children's book. She grew up in Wisconsin and lives in Brooklyn and the Adirondacks. Without further ado, Lisa. Great, I may need to adjust this a little bit. No, I think that's good. Wow. Well, thank you, Judy, and thank you, Hanny. Um, what amazing uh, work to uh, to listen to while I was waiting to read. I mean, it's amazing. I, uh, Judy and I have worked together, and Hanny and I are also working together now in master class together. So it's it's really great. I'm very grateful to the Writers Studio to be to be in it and to participate. And many thanks to all my teachers. Um, to all my teachers, all my students, and all of us together. Uh, the North Way, uh, for people in the writer's studio, um, every poem in the North Way um, and every poem that I published really originally started as an exercise. Um, so that's just been tons of fun. And right now, um, as I'm sort of contemplating, you know, work ahead, I, I don't have any exercises. My mind is completely blank. I don't have a narrator anymore. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so if anyone has any ideas, please let me know. <laughs> uh, the first poem I'm going to read is titled, Monkey Spinning a Prayer Wheel. I stumble out of the theater after waiting for Godot. Geez, I gripe to Peter, that's it? We're all just wind and gristle? After a moment, he says, yep. And I know he's trying to remember whether he'd stuck the parking ticket in his wallet or pocket. He gallantly takes the notion of a meaningless universe in stride, while I feel like a bewildered monkey spinning a prayer wheel, trying to contemplate so-called larger questions. At the Tibetan Buddhist Center downtown, we recite the Heart Sutra, Perceiving, perceiving that personality is inherently empty, saves beings from suffering, as monks' red cheeks puffed like twenty dizzy Gillespies accompany us, blowing horns, strident heralds announcing ego's apocalypse, and I'm thinking, what? What are we talking about here? I recite daily my version of Marvin Gaye's mantra, as fast as I can. What's going on? What's going on? What's really going on? <laughs> oh God, send me someone wise and shivering, the archangel carrying the sword to cut through confusion. Or, if no archangel handy, send me a soothing jazzy brunch contralto, an arm to pull me onto the raft as I thrash in Dugga's river, my memory of chipping a rock on our backyard granite rock, wailing as my mother runs from sunbathing, reading Leon Uris, her freckled arms, the smell of suntan oil. Where is she? Where is she? Um, many of the poems in the North Way were written um, in partly, partly inspired by uh, living up in the Adirondacks, you know, for a small portion of time. Uh, and Wild Pansy is one of those poems um, written, written in the voice of the flower. As a seed, I was shot out the back end of a blue jay. When heedless, she flew over the meadow. She had swallowed me in my homeland when she spied me lying easy under the sun. Briefly, I called her mother before I passed through her gullet like a ghost. In a blink of God's eye, I was an orphan. I trembled where I fell alone in the dirt. 
That first night was a long night, early May and chilly, and I remember rain filled my furrow. I called out for mercy, only a wolverine wandered by. I cursed my luck, I cursed the happenstance of this world, I smelled his hot stink, but he nosed me deep into the mud. This was the gift of obscurity. I germinated, hidden from the giants of earth, the jostling stalks, the various boisterous bloomers, and this was my salvation. After seven days and nights, I pushed through. Yes, here I am kissable, your tiny purple perfusion. So also up in uh, the Adirondacks, there are other flowers who speak, and this is the black-eyed Susan. I just cannot bloom endlessly, you know. <laughs> this is November. I'm pale, a dry stalk. I can barely shit stand. I'm shaking. I need me time. I need to center myself. This summer was horrific. It was all about the aphids crawling, depositing God knows what without permission. <laughs> From who knows what hollows of slime. It was all about the jays by mistake. They grab, smashed into me to grab the crickets. I had to hear the swallowing, see the bulging gullets. <laughs> this summer was all about the bees, their selfishness, their lack of tenderness. Bees are sly. They say they buzz for beauty, for splendor. They preen like debutantes, a racket people, a con job. They trampled on my privates, scurried back and forth. Mobsters with booty, my pollen, in their dank clubs, their little hives. This summer was all about the deer, the nibbling, the slobbering, ticks crawling in and out of their noses. Sweet Jesus, a sight no one should have to endure. And who in the meadow thought to kiss my petals? People, I'm on my own here. I need TLC. Look, dormant does not mean down for the count. I will reseed myself, reinvent myself. I'm hardiest of the hardy perennials, but I need to be pumped from below, long and slow, cool water brimming under the meadow. I need the slathering, mud pack sliding in my floweret, wet leaves, damn it, someone needs to soothe my pistol. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> The next poem, I actually, um, I had tons of fun a few weeks ago reading in the Adirondacks. Um, it was great. It, it was so much fun. This is a poem I do not read up there because it's sort of a touchy subject. Um, the feral pigs are not everyone's best friend. So, <laughs> To the feral pigs of Clinton County. Root on, ladies and gentlemen. Yes to sex with multiple partners. Yes to your nipples, the color and size of Cuban cigars. Yes to fields overrun with your sucklings. When I say feral pig, I see darting eyes, envision a remorseless nature. But if I say wild boar, I hear golden flugelhorns. Where is it written you were meant to be constrained? Yes to grunts and drooling. Yes to dripping snouts, shoveling beetles out of loam. Yes to nocturnal plunder of apple and pear orchards, gorging on Anjou, Empire, and Crispin. Is this not your right? Are you not descended from imported Burgundian boars? Did they not bust loose? Every aristocrat is a secret anarchist. Yes to pissing long and yellow on domestic and civic order. Yes to your budding over of stone walls mortared by heroes of the early republic. Yes to your ancestors' refusal to eat bucketed swill flung at them in their pens. Root on, ladies and gentlemen. Root on. So yeah, we keep that one in New York. So okay, bark eater. Um, bark eater is a term you hear a lot in the Adirondacks, and there's a purported myth um, that it is originally an English translation of a Native American word, um, and it was theoretically used in a derogatory way by Mohawks. All of this is, you know, completely untrue, but it's what 
people say about themselves. Bark eater. Yes, a snooty mohawk word for bumpkin, for yokel lacking the smarts and gumption to hunt. But I say a bark eater makes do. Consider this, a hungry traveler on a hard journey who, as the pale winter sun goes down, sees only trees and snow, but does not lose her cool. She refuses to starve. Without hesitation, she sharpens the knife, slices a white pine and roasts the bark like a banquet of bear steak. This barren meal is hardly a tale told by an idiot. She is pleased to call it feast. Girl, my mother used to say, you always land on your feet. The bark eater toasts the dog star and asks for protection, thus surviving yet another frozen night without tears. She knows she can cry all she wants in the spring. Missy, my father used to say, just play the cards you're dealt. A bark eater spies the morning star and spits into the wind her prayer of water and air. She doesn't need a compass. She knows she's walking north. She's traveling light. So, uh, The next poem is has kind of a tidy title in this book, Who Can Forget the Grannies? Um, it's coming in North New Ohio Review, uh, which came out just before the book. The title is actually, I think, like something like Naked Screaming Yelling Grannies, which is <laughs> really the original <laughs> title. Um, and probably the title I prefer. Um, it came about because I'm really fascinated by the notion of these giant mammals um, prowling North America, like, I don't know, really long time ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, tens of thousands, I guess, I'm not sure. Um, but they're just huge animals. And I was particularly intrigued by the thought of eight foot beavers. So, who, I was, who can forget the grannies? <laughs> I shudder when I think of the eight-foot beavers grunting, squatting, splashing, spitting in a river, tiny-brained, squinting, Pleistocene thugs, bearing incisors longer than a human arm, the infested ponds and rivers, smothered, gasping fish with their acid-spiked, toxic urine. They slap their murderous tails, bleeding. They drag themselves up the riverbank, smelling sweet grass. They charge the crawling babies, the tiny baby bones, trampling. They didn't care. Hooray for naked, yelling, Stone Age grannies. They dropped hammer stones, grabbed sharpened sticks. Who can forget their skinny, bouncing breasts. They beat the giant beavers. They speared, they smeared thick beaver blood over each other's faces, over their bony, serviceable buttocks. Who can forget the grannies? I know this happened, by the way. <laughs> In the old days. It's not yet a diorama, though, in the Natural History Museum. <laughs> I'd like it to be. Okay, Ezekiel. Um, I wrote this poem immediately after the November 2016 election, and as far as I'm concerned, it still holds. It's still, it's still in operation. Ezekiel. I will send the reign of authority, reign to chase the devil back to hell, smeary ghost goose shit rain, rain of snarling martins, rain of mud and tar, rumors of war rain, rain to trigger his disgust, rain of defiant lovers, naked tongue rain, his worst nightmare rain. I will send the rain of warrior babies, tiny swords, tiny bre breastplates of righteousness. I will send flummoxing rain, rain to ding his, his minions, spiritual warfare rain. I will send rain in it for the long haul, rain biding its tongue. Time, watchful crow rain, rain beyond his pay grade, deceptively soft, Matahari rain. I will send slain in the spirit rain, holy ghost rain, prophecy rain, om, shanti, shanti rain, no tweeting rain, turn off the TV rain, rain to scour the, his demon stink, rain of purification, everlasting white birch rain, God help me, help me rain. I will send blasting rain, scram, I will say, beat it. I will say, be gone. So. Okay. Uh, I've always loved snakes. And um, 
that continues and this title this poem is titled i like the serpent uh, i like the serpent i don't care what someone somewhere said to eve he is my pretty green little thing when i doze in the meadow he perceives he stirs in his hole he slides stickiness tongue in my ear i startle awake I tickle his vestigial chin with fernal stalks. He rises, rippling. You, he hisses, I whisper. Here I am. Okay. My Holy Spirit, my Holy Spirit. At dawn, my Holy Spirit smokes tiny cigars, exhales into the clouds. A gust that jumpstarts sleeping beasts fires up the chlorophyll frosts and churns the ocean brine. She proceeds from a blind date, polyandrist in the Pleistocene, among warm nutrient-laden raindrops, sentient dolphins, mineral-rich dust streaming from explosive supernovas. These days, my Holy Spirit drives her own car, registered with the Department of Insouciance. She speaks through the peepers. My Holy Spirit loves naked. Who's her daddy? Nobody knows. So. I'll read a few more poems. I'm going to read um, My Sweet Little Pigeons, I think. Um, uh, yeah. My Sweet Little Pigeons. At the Buddhist party, I help Nimala, the monk who loves vavos as if they were ponies, hang scarlet banners from elms until I hear shouts, exhausted meditators colliding at volleyball. They need red meat, says Tenzin, resident lama, flipping his cigarette bus butt into the grass. Jesus, someone says. I thought Tibetans were supposed to be, like, spiritual? Tenzin laughs, his face a brown wrinkled moon, and I remember Byron Putnam, my Chippewa uncle, belly swollen with hams, smoked trout, and beef stew, lying with his friends on Sheboygan's courthouse lawn, smoking and singing, I am ready, my sweet little pigeons, I am ready for love, how he held me, hands soft on my shoulders, when I was scared, before I collapsed from decades of drinking, dined silently at the VA hospital in Marion. The breeze flutters white prayer flags, releasing 27,000 invitations into the ghost realm. A white feral cat crouches under the magnolias, tracks birds overhead. May she be happy. May the bacteria in my strawberry yogurt be happy, cruising down the river, digested peacefully before my colon spasmodic turbulence induces vertigo or hysteria. May the gnats biting me take rebirth as neonatal nurses soothe me the first hours of my next life. May they be happy, free from fear. May the elderly alligator sunbathing on the golf course next to my mother's condo loosen his leviathan jaws, allow the visiting pug from Brooklyn to wiggle free. <laughs> May they both be happy. So may my mother binoculars raise, although I'm not 100% sure which one she's rooting for. May she too be happy. Tonight Tibetans will empty glasses and bowls to keep lonely circling spirits from drowning. May they be happy, free from fear. Uncle, may you quench your unquenchable thirst. May we shelter under the refuge tree. May I sleep, swaying and bunting, the beloved undevoured lamb. Read a few more poems. I'm going to read an older poem, but it's a poem that um, I always enjoy uh, listening to. I hope you do too. Life is Lucy. Bernice, my neighbor, misheard my name when we met. Lucy, she asked as I introduced myself. My ears perked up like an eager dog off the leash, hearing the beloved friend call her name. Suddenly alert amidst the city's distraction and babble, fragrant pigeons just out of reach, sirens, couples growling face to face in the street. There's nothing soft or vague about Lucy. Lucy's a dachshund digging under the rose bush grandma planted, salivating for tasty mole scraps, ignoring cries and folded newspaper swatting behind her. Lucy's a bookie, sporting a pork pie hat, cigar clamped in her mouth. She's running on spit, playing the odds for more time to make good on her bets. Lucy is bucky. You're getting bucky again, my mother would say. 
Brown silky hair chopped at the ears, bangs cut, razors straight, jaw set, lower lip ready for battle. Seven, fringed cowgirl suit, cap pistols ready to draw from my holster. She meant stubborn dug in as in no, I won't eat the creamed corn. Like my childhood guru, Peter Rabbit, canny model of spiritual development, who refusing a life of deprivation, pathetic nose pressed to the fence, smashed constraints of class and birth, feasted without regret on all the French beans, lettuce, and radishes he could eat. Lucy, meaning light or radiance, bright with righteous rage for the newborns, who eyes opening in wonder, flinch in pain and confusion as nurses drop silver nitrate into their eyes. Yes, I'm anointed, but no, I will not stop to shovel manure. I follow one who parties with thieves and tax collectors, drunkards carrying torches into the bridal chamber. Those with eyes to see, let them see. Yes, I will pick up the slack, but no, I will not wait for the kingdom. No, I will not save the best for the last. I am the first and the last. I am burning a 10,000 year filament. At daybreak, I shook hands with Ezekiel. He said, girl, you're doing just fine. Thank you. I'll read, um, I'll read one more poem, I guess. I'll read The North Way, which is the uh, title of the book. And The North Way, for people who don't know, is a, um, it's the New York Thruway, um, north of Albany, between Albany and Montreal, through what's sometimes called the North Country. And I urge anyone who hasn't been up there to... Um, to go up there. I think I connected with it big time because in a lot of ways it's a lot like Wisconsin. There's this like cultural swath in the upper Midwest that actually goes through upstate New York and I never realized. Um, you know, I found some of my people back there, up there, grisly as that is. Um, <laughs> the North Way. If I drive with my eyes closed, I imagine the road better. I hear music, oh, ah, hum, subliminal, vibrating, GPS of the strawberry moon. My sonic bat waves guide me while my beloved passenger dozes. I soar through midnight shadows, purple breezes, languid rafts of loons past the firefly-lit town of Minerva, where locals insist angels flourish fiery swords, signaling signs and wonders, marking the boundary between previous humdrum exits, the extraordinary one ahead. And I sing, you're a shining star, no matter who you are, to disconsolate Holsteins slumped against fences, and I soar, light from light, true gal from true gal, as foxes crouched in bushes, yip encouragement, till I slip through a shimmering door, clouds of white crickets, thistles whispering my secret wishes. If I drive with my eyes closed, I hear the far-off tinkling, two people toasting with ice sarsaparilla, the house where we are going, where two people, once dead, are now alive. Thank you.